together and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to our Advocacy Day, um, which as you know is part of the National South Asian Summit that we have been gathered um, here in DC for the last three and a half days. And it is very important that we're here to kind of raise our voices with legislators and congressional members uh, because we have many stories to tell uh, from our experiences and from our communities. And so um, as we're here today, um, I, I know that some of you um, had some delays um, dealing with luggage and I think that it's kind of apropos in terms of what um, is happening uh, in terms of the climate of security and scrutiny um, in our communities and we're going to be talking about some of that um, this morning as well. Um, so as you know, this year marks the 10 year anniversary of September 11th and that was a watershed moment for our community members. And what we want to do throughout the year is really contribute to the process of reflection that our country is undoubtedly going to be engaged in over the next few months. And for South Asian communities, um, we think that it's so important that we contribute to that process of reflection by adding our voices, adding our stories, adding our experiences. And we'll be working, all of us together, in doing that in a variety of different ways um, over the course of the year. And one way of doing that is to raise our voices here on Capitol Hill through this community briefing and the member visits that you all will be doing after um, the, the briefing. Um, I know that there are also some staffers that are here from um, different congressional offices and we thank you for joining us. Um, we hope that you'll find the information that will be shared um, by community members uh, to be um, really informative and useful in the work that you're doing. So um, what we're going to start with um, is a community briefing that's going to really look at the question of what has been the continuing impact of the 9-11 moment on South Asian communities over the past decade. And we're going to really hear from voices from the community and we'll then hear from um, policy experts who can provide some recommendations in terms of where our country needs to go. So what I'm going to do is start off and introduce you to our first panel. And I will introduce um, each speaker one by one, and each speaker will have about five minutes um, to share some remarks with you. And then once we are completed with the first panel, we will um, engage in a Q&A session for a few minutes as well. So it's my pleasure uh, to welcome all of our speakers here today. I know that many of you travel to be with us, and we really appreciate that you're here, and we really um, value all of the tremendous work that you do on a daily basis for our communities and with our communities. So I want to start off um, with Talat Hamdani, who's with the September 11th Families for Peaceful Tomorrows in New York. I'll turn it over to you, Talat. Good morning, everybody. I took the 4.40 a.m. train from New York today in the morning, and I'm half asleep now. <laughs> With a very bad back and a head of thumb. Uh, we are really at a very crucial uh, moment in our, you know, history of our nation. And what's transpiring, what's happening in 10 years later is a serious concern that everybody Every single American citizen should really get involved and speak up. Uh, as you introduce me, I'm Talat Hamdani, and I'm a member of September 11th Families for Peace for Tomorrow's, an organization of more than 200 families who have advocated peace and nonviolence actions to address the issues that are ongoing issues, especially post 9 11 issues. I lost my son, Salman at the North Tower on September 11, 2001. As a mother, I was ecstatic when he was born. And 23 years later, he left me with eternal grief. I came here on February 3rd, 79. When Salman was 13 months old, he could neither talk nor walk. He was calling. He 
grew up in Brooklyn with my other two boys who were born here, and they went to St. Cecilia's till this eighth grade. And then he graduated from Bayside High, where he was an A student participating in debate team, in the swimming team, and in the football team also. He wore his father's store address number 79 on the jersey. Uh, he went on to graduate from Queen's College in chemistry in June 2001. And he graduated that year, 6th of June, at the Quad. Salman wanted to become a physician and to get into a medical college, you need to do extracurricular activities. So he took his EMT certification. He joined the NYPD cadet system. He studied, he went and took the student study abroad, abroad program, exchange program, and put in hours at uh, Jamaica Hospital. And all these things, all these factors that he aspired, he was working towards to become a medical doctor, worked against him when 9-11 happened. Salman worked at the ambulance at Metro Ambulance for one year from 2000 to 2001, March. And this was his last year in the NYPD as a cadet, 2001, December. He joined Harvard Hughes Medical Institute as a protein lab analyst at the end of July, 2001. And we as a family were very happy for the first time that after all these years, we have accomplished our dream and now our son, one child will be earning and bringing home more money. And then, Unfortunately, 9-11 happened, and Salman answered the call of duty, and instead of going to his job at Rockefeller University in Manhattan, uptown, he went downtown because he took the number seven train going in, and from the elevation, you know, it's elevated at Queensboro Plaza, he went down to help a rescue, and gave the ultimate sacrifice. And it is mentioned, his heroism is mentioned in the Patriot Act, which is itself something that needs to be repealed. We were devastated and searched for him at Ground Zero for two weeks. And then we were visited by uh, different people from the um, Criminal Investigation Bureau. We got phone calls from different uh, people claiming they were police officers, detectives. And the questions were about you know, who was he, what was he wearing, where would he go, what would he be doing. And then we went to Mecca in October 11th to pray. And as you know, many, there was a big dragnet. Many Muslims, Arab Americans, and Middle Eastern people were detained. So the hope was maybe he is detained. And then someone came to the store. We had a store in Brooklyn. And they said, you know, write a letter. He might be detained. So after we came back from Mecca, there was a uh, message on the answering machine from Congressman Ackerman's office to contact him. They have news of our son. So we contacted his office, and he also you know, made us believe that he may be detained. He did not deny it. So the hope was there, and the media, uh, there was a flyer circulating the NYPD, the MTA, with his picture from his um, NYPD registration with the sign saying wanted by the terrorist task force chemistry major has police ID and this is what the New York Post published that day and we were not here to defend ourselves we were in Mecca missing or hiding and it says in here that you know he left home with Quran in hand as though he was he was uh, you know one of the terrorists all these insinuations, and it is, it, it, so, but, coming back to the issue, and it is also insinuated that he was seen at Midtown Tunnel, and, and the place to look for him is not at the debris or the Twin Towers, but, you know, somewhere else, he's hiding somewhere. So six months later, then, you know, his remains were confirmed through DNA, 34 pieces, and we buried him, we buried the remains, and that is how his reputation was redeemed. And we buried him, it will be nine months tomorrow, April 5th, 2002.
and then two years later my husband died. He couldn't take it. And a decade later, here I am, testifying as to what happened nine years ago. Nine years ago, I lost my son. I lost my faith because of those hijackers. And now, we all are threatened to lose our nationality, our identity as Americans. And that's what we are fighting for. And the sad part is that we are fighting a group of small, few selfish, politically driven politicians are still bent on exploiting the worst tragedy of the, you know, in mankind's history for their own selfish agendas. I attended the hearings of Congressman King when he had them in D.C. You know, a month ago. And he went on Fox and said that this never happened to my son and I am lying. I really want Congressman Peter King to have a face-on-face -face conversation with me on national television. And I will answer all his questions. People of all faith died on 9-11, and they died because, not of their faith, race, or ethnicity, but because they were Americans. That's who was, who was targeted by the terrorists. America was targeted. And Salman went to rescue his fellow Americans, and he did not stop to ponder, who am I going to rescue? Am I going to rescue a, rescue a Christian person, or a, a Jewish person, or a Hindu, or a person of no faith? And since 9-11, American Muslims have carried the cross. They have been, they have been, I do not agree, with Senator Graham's statement that we are not involved. We have been involved since day one. We are at the, fore, at the front lines fighting terrorism. The, the American community, the Indian community, the Asian community, we are fighting terrorism. We are at the front lines. And it is, and it is worse than second, the Second World War dragnet. You know, many American Muslims are still detained. Three incidents I want to just recapture for you. 2005, we came back from the Bahamas cruise. The immigrants or customs went into my son's cabin because of their first name. So there's discrimination not, not only by profiling visually, but by name, Muhammad or Sayyid or Hassan or Ali. Then uh, we went to the cruise and I was, I think I'm on a no-fly list or so for some reason. She was giving my number to some security TSA person verifying by my driver's license. And the third occasion, of course, whenever you fly anywhere, I'm pulled aside for a Hamdani name, and my son, his first name is Muhammad, is pulled aside. In conclusion, I would like to say, uh, it is time for the U.S. Congress to stand up and protect civil liberties and of all Americans, not only of a few, all the people that died that day on 9-11, they died because they believed in the American values of democracy, liberty, and freedom. Freedom of, to pursue a faith of their own choice. And that is what is needed now in order for us to come together and heal and move forward as a united nation. Thank you. immense personal courage that you have to continue doing the work that you do, but thank you for adding your voice. Um, next, I want to um, introduce Ronami Molik, um, who many of you know, she is a longtime advocate on um, issues affecting immigrant communities, and she's the director of Daisy's Rising Up and Moving. Monami. Thank you, Deepa, and thank you, Dalit. I've heard you speak before, and you represent for me one of the many, many courageous people in the last 10 years who've continued to raise your voice despite such an immense public climate, usually against us. Um, I represent an organization called DRUM, Desi's Rising Up and Moving. We were formed actually before 
uh, in the late 90s when we started seeing not just the rise of South Asian low-wage workers in the US and predominantly Muslim, but the rise in the vulnerability of our community from increasing measures of immigration enforcement and law enforcement. So we're going back to the 1996 immigration laws that had a huge impact on our community where thousands of people started being detained even back then. And of course, when 9-11 hit, it was the green light to go after Muslims, particularly. Um, when 9-11 hit, our organization immediately went out on the streets on September 12th, started mass flyering uh, all over in every borough, and we started getting calls back on our uh, hotline, which was in my living room, because we had no office, no staff, we were volunteer. And I started getting calls literally from hundreds of uh, women and men saying, my husband hasn't come home, my roommate hasn't come home, uh, my friend is missing, he was picked up from work, and then we started tracking people because we were already working inside the immigration detention centers. And we found hundreds of people, predominantly Muslim men, um, from who, people who were gas station workers, restaurant workers, taxi drivers, and I remember being one of the first people to go to Passaic County Jail, literally, uh, and, and meet some of these men in a room, in a dark room. Uh, on the other side, there was 60 or 70 older men who are from our communities, and I was in tears because they were all just desperate to talk to me and ask me, what's happening? Why am I here? We don't even know. We just got brought in the middle of the night. No one even knows that we're here. And I was in tears because they all looked like my father, and they were like my father, and I grew up in these communities, and I saw what was happening. Um, well, we worked with thousands of those uh, Muslim, predominantly men and some women, who we called the disappeared. Um, and to this day, that's, it's never been acknowledged that these mass sweeps happened, that thousands of people were deported. Uh, for no reason, no, no material witnesses were found, reasons, no reason other than immigration status. And so I want to talk about how one of the, the threads, the increasing threads and threats to not just the South Asian community, but to, to civil rights and human rights in the U.S. is the rising uh, immigration enforcement uh, programs that we're seeing. The ICE access programs, the 2003 formation of the Department of Homeland Security from what used to be called Immigration and Natural, Natural, uh, Naturalization Service. So forever now, this nation is equating immigrants and immigration with national security and the war on terror. That's a dangerous, dangerous precedent for us. Um, what we've seen out of that is an increase in raids, in money going towards the building of immigrant detention centers, programs like the CLEAR Act that was tried to be passed under the Bush administration and did under Obama's administration, which is now called 287G agreements that deputize local police to basically often profile people um, and arrest uh, based on immigration status. Um, in New York City, uh, it's a place where we don't technically have 287G. We have an executive order that protects us, don't ask, don't tell policy on immigration status, but the reality is that's not what happens on the ground. And we need more documentation in our community. In 2006, Drum released a report that showed that 46% of the 700 Muslim youth that we in, uh, interviewed and surveyed were asked or threatened by their immigration status by law enforcement or officials in and around their school. This is the climate that our young people are living in, especially if you're undocumented, Muslim, and young. Um, I also want to just highlight some other programs that, that, that we've seen that, that need to, 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 to end and to roll back. Um, the heightened use of informants in our community uh, with no accountability. There needs to be revisions of these FBI guidelines that place informants in our homes, our masjids, uh, our, our workplaces, our community centers like DRUM, um, and we've seen ourselves and we have members who've been the victims of some severe entrapment cases where it was cases of people paid $100,000 who work for the NYPD to entrap vulnerable young men from our community. And, and one of the mothers who's been an outspoken leader whose son is facing 30 years and conviction is here, Siraj Mateen's mother, Shahina Praveen. 
Um, and the other day-to-day -day things that we see include stop and frisk by local police that target Muslims, but as they do other people of color, subway bag searches at heightened moments of Islamophobia. When the Park 51 incident happened, we saw that happening again. Um, raids in homes, stores. We have many members who've been pulled off of buses, uh, Greyhound buses and Amtraks because they're Muslim or look Muslim and then their immigration status was checked. Um, and at the end of the day, it's also our community's responsibility to oppose policies like SB 1070, which is spreading everywhere, secure communities, 287G, and the collaboration between local immigration and federal police. Um, and these are all things that Peter King's hearings at the end of the day are going to bring more and more resources towards this kind of enforcement that detracts from civil rights and liberties. And I'm, our hope is that in the next 10 years we grow stronger and our advocates and allies go stronger in protecting the civil rights of all communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, and, uh, we're so happy to have Shahina and Kazi here as well. Thank you. Um, I want to now turn it over to Gurvinder Singh, um, who is a student and who is um, with, affiliated with the Sikh Coalition, um, which is a partner organization of SALTS. Gurvinder. Oh, good morning. Oh, first of all, good morning to everyone who has joined us for this event. And I would like to thank SALT for giving me this opportunity to share my experiences on bullying with you. So I'm 18 years old and my parents moved from India to America when I was two years old. And I grew up in Richmond Hill, Queens. Um, uh, ever since then, I remember I've gone through so much. Um, it wasn't exactly bullying that started uh, in elementary school. So um, if I uh, communicated with any of my classmates, they wouldn't uh, reply or they would just walk away. Uh, because um, I looked different, um, because I had a turban. Um, after 9-11, things got worse. Uh, kids called me uh, names, and they would ask me if you were uh, affiliated with Osama bin Laden, or they would call me bin Laden um, themselves, and they would call me a terrorist. And, um, so, uh, when, uh, after school, I used to go home on a school bus, and. I used to avoid the kids as much as I can and because they used to uh, look at me awkwardly. Um, so one time on the bus ride home, uh, a kid uh, pulled my turban, he uh, removed the cloth off my hair and I couldn't do anything, I was helpless at that time and no one was there to stand up for me. So I had to walk home with my hair open and I really didn't know how to tie my hair back then because my mom was the one who did everything. So uh, at the also at the beginning of the middle middle school, I I decided to cut my hair. Why? Because I thought if I cut my hair, I wouldn't um, they wouldn't call me a terrorist, and I would they would be uh, they would um, able I would able to, I would be able to fit into uh, their groups more, and uh, they would accept me more. And uh, before I. Uh, I, then I started to grow back my hair because I was exposed to Sikhism and our rituals and I, I was very enthusiastic and I started attending the prayers and, and then I decided to uh, grow back my hair. And before I grew back my hair, I, I used to meet with this one kid in middle school and we used to talk to each other and very politely and uh, as I started uh, growing back my hair, uh, he ended up, and he ended up being in my eighth grade class. So I went back to him. and I was like, uh, "Hey, how are you? And do you remember me?" But and he was like, "No, I don't." And he would try to avoid me, or he would he would just say, "I don't know you." So uh, so uh, he ended up being he was in my eighth grade class. So one day in math class, uh, uh, this teacher stepped out for a moment, and he threw something at me and. Uh, it was a pencil, and when I turned around, uh, I asked him, why did you throw this at me? And he was like, do you want to fight? There was no reason to fight, but, and I told him no, but he created a scene, and, and the whole classroom surrounded uh, both of us, and all I could have done at that moment was try to defend myself, even though I didn't. 
So we ended up having the fight and then the security guards came, they took us into the, the dean's office and I was filed for suspension along with him. And during the process, he looked at me and I, I still remember, and he said that I'd watch your back. And, and I knew something was going to happen. So right after, I, right after the, uh, we were filed, I, uh, I ran as fast as I can towards the subway just to uh, get home safe. And I was about three minutes away from school, and when I turned around, there was a there were a group of uh, five to six people running after me, and I uh, I got really scared, and I told them, and then they caught up with me, and I told them I re I'm really sorry, I didn't mean to do this, even though it wasn't my fault. And uh, there were people around me. I, I even asked them for help, if you can help me, and because I'm gonna be attacked. So what ended up happening, the kid, he banged my head into a pole, a metallic pole, and I just fell to the ground, and uh, uh, when I got up, they, they all escaped, and uh, was, my head was bleeding, and no one helped, and I, and I really thought something should have been done, because what if they pulled out a knife or a gun, they would, they would just still stand there? I mean, they should, uh, someone should have helped at least. Uh, if 9-11 didn't happen, or if people were aware of uh, Sikhism, people wouldn't call me these names. Um, they would think of me as a, uh, they wouldn't think of me as a dangerous person. People would see me, or a Sikh individual standing in front of them as an ordinary person. They wouldn't have bad thoughts pop up into their minds, and they wouldn't be afraid. They would respect our religion, and they would respect the way we look and they would respect us. Now that I'm older, I want to help seek the kids, and I don't want them to go through what I went through in my childhood. I want to tell other kids that they shouldn't be afraid. If they are afraid, they should tell people. Now we have all these organizations like the Sikh Coalition, the, the Drum Organization, um, and they shouldn't give up. Um, uh, everyone should live in peace, whether they're Sikh or any other religion. I want bullying to end. And uh, there was an incident that happened this morning. Uh, we were uh, heading towards the capital, and uh, all of a sudden there were a, a few police officers that were, uh, they just called us uh, from behind. And along with me was Rajdeep and Sandy. And <laughs> so uh, we were uh, called to a corner, and they said the civilian, um, uh, filed a complaint saying that uh, we were doing something, we were doing a suspicious acti activity. And I thought that was really, um, uh, that was ridiculous. And so, uh, this is all I have to share. Thank, Thank you so you. much for that. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And, um, I think you're right that you know if incidents like that can happen here at the people's place, um, they're obviously happening everywhere, all over the country. Um, I want to turn it over now to Manju Kulkarni. Manju is the executive director of the South Asian Network in Southern California. Manju. Good morning. Thank you, Vika. Um, so I'm here today um, testifying on behalf of the South Asian Network. The South Asian Network is a grassroots community-based organization dedicated to advancing the health, empowerment, and solidarity of persons of South Asian origin in Southern California. SAN, as the organization is also known, serves the South Asian American community in the areas of violence prevention, health care, and civil rights. Through organizing and advocacy, SAN works to address social injustice and build alliances for long-term social change. I'm here today to share with you our community's experiences involving post-9-11 racial profiling that results from the Suspicious Activity Reporting Initiative. The SAR initiative instructs police to gather and report nonspecific data on people deeming to be acting suspiciously. The information is then funneled to intelli intelligence fusion centers and then to broader national security bu bureaucracy. For members of our community whose non-criminal behavior is being tracked, the activities cause significant disruption and considerable fear. One member of our community experienced this very fear and disruption when he came into contact with SAR activities. 
In 2007, Zul Sarani and his partner drove to the city of Orange to shoot a number of photographs of architecturally significant buildings. The city had a number of very well preserved old buildings, including some Art Deco offices that housed city government. Seeing Zul and his partner take these photographs, a stranger at the scene apparently took down their license plate number and physical description. A few days later, they received a visit from a law enforcement officer. When neither Zul nor his partner was at home, the official spoke with their neighbors as well as the owner of the building. The owner then called Zul, asking him a number of questions and insinuating that he and his partner were involved in criminal activity. Several days later, the law enforcement officer returned and interviewed Zul's partner at length. Luckily, because Zul's partner had labeled and cataloged the photos with detailed descriptions of their architectural style, the official believed his explanation and left, left without taking further action. Still, the two of them were left extremely rattled by the experience, distrustful of their neighbors, and fearful of eviction by their landlord and continued police surveillance. There are countless other stories uh, like these, including the one today of Gurwinder leaving his luggage at the assigned space in the Cannon Building. Similarly, individuals in our community have been approached by police for using the restroom in an airplane or praying in public. Suspicious activity reporting efforts such as these have sprung up across the country. In March 2008, the Los Angeles Police Department, through Special Order 11, created iWatch, a program instructing officers to compile information on criminal and non-criminal activities. Similarly, the police department initiated a Muslim mapping program to record residential locations of thousands of Muslim Americans in Southern California. Shifting the focus to non-criminal activity has clogged intelligence pipelines with junk data derived from racial, ethnic, and religious bias and eroded community trust among South Asian American communities like ours. Suspicious activity reporting violates federal law banning police from collecting information unless there's reasonable suspicion of criminal conduct. Moreover, it runs contrary to basic constitutional freedoms that we as Americans hold dear. Almost 70 years ago, racial and ethnic bias, rather than documented criminal behavior, led to the internment of over 100,000 Japanese Americans. We ask Congress today to investigate this initiative and consider putting an end to a program that fosters widespread racial profiling and repeat some of the same mistakes our country made seven decades ago. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manjun, for also showing us that the impact of the past 10 years goes well beyond New York City, the East Coast, and, and extends to, to California and other states. Um, next, it's my pleasure to introduce Prajit Singh. Um, Prajit is um, local here in the Maryland area, and would like to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to very much thank uh, SALT for this opportunity, as well as um, putting this together, because I think it's so needed. Um, my incident um, that occurred with me happened on February the, uh, August to 17th, sorry, uh, 2007. Um, when I was taking a flight uh, out of Baltimore, Washington International Airport, and I was going down to Alabama to go visit my relative. And I was going to be uh, going and switching a flight uh, in Atlanta. And so when I went uh, to the airport, I you know, checked in my luggage, everything went well, um, and I boarded with my carry-on uh, to get onto the airplane. Before that, I was going to go through security. Um, my luggage went through. I also went through with no issue. And as soon as I went through that, metal detector and it did not beep, the official of TSA said, sir, you do know you're going to have to go through a mandatory pat down of your turban. I said, excuse me? I said, that's a breaking of my civil liberties. It does not make any sense because I have not beeped. There's nothing that is irregular with me that would need you to warrant you to have a secondary search. And he says, no, the policy has changed, sir, and you have to go through a mandatory pat down of your turban. And he said, well, if you don't believe me, let me get you my supervisor. So his supervisor then comes out and he says, look, sir, you know, th this is the way it works. When you get your ticket, you give up your civil liberties and your civil rights right there. That's the end. 
If you want to fly in a plane, you give them up. I said, I said, that's not correct. That's not accurate. I said, you do not give up your civil liberties when you choose to, to take a flight. He said, you know what, sir? You're bothering me so much now, you're not even going to fly today. He said, you're getting out. Get out of this blind. Get out. You're not going to be flying. Bye. So he literally kicked me out. And he, of course, was raging with anger, and he was so loud. Of course, all of the other passengers are seeing the situation. And so I now I think to myself, what do I do? Because it's approximately 7 a.m. in the morning. And so I go and I start making phone calls to my family, thinking, what do I do now? Because I will not be able to get on this flight. And as I'm there making those phone calls, that same security supervisor comes by and goes to the local uh, stand that's a newspaper stand. And on his way back, he says, well, if you're nice this time, I'll let you go through now. Now, is that good security? I mean, and so subjective. And at that point, then, I go ahead and I go through, um, and I go through the metal detector again, do not beep, and he says, now, well, now you're going to have to go through that mandatory pat down. I said, excuse me? And so now we go into this room and with another TSA officer, and this officer is literally shaking because he's so nervous, has never done a pat down. And he, starts, and he starts to pat down my turban, and he starts to feel the different, and he says, well, it seems okay now. And he keeps going patting down until he finds a wooden comb that I have. He says, what's this? And the, the security supervisor says, well, tell him, what is it? What is it? He says, it's a wooden comb. Oh, okay. It goes through. At the end, and now it's finished, the supervisor then looks at me. With no hesitation, he says, well, was that a breaking of your civil liberties? For me, it was so daunting, so painful, because now he goes into this rant about how civil liberties are just, you know, they give them up all the time, there's not even a point for them. And how, you know, I, people just are just speaking about civil liberties as though it's a God-given right. And I said, can I just please be able to go and take my flight? I run to my flight, and I sit down, and at that point I look around and I say to myself, what all these individuals, you know, have gone through um, to be here is nothing comparatively to what I just went through. And that is in itself discrimination and the pain of discrimination, which is to feel that you're less than a human being. And that's what I share with you all, which is that that's the reason we need to stop in discrimination, hate, prejudice, bias, because that's when an individual feels that they're less than a human being, that they're not good enough. And that's what I hope that we were able to accomplish. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prochith, for sharing your story. Um, last but not least, we have Linda Sarsour, who is with the National Network of Arab American Communities and the Arab American Association of New York. Linda, thank you. Um, so my name is Linda Sarsour, I'm the Advocacy and Civic Engagement Coordinator for the National Network for Arab American Communities based out in Dearborn, Michigan. I'm based in New York at the Arab American Association um, of New York. So I'm going to kind of take, take the stories and kind of put it all together into context and talk about the present. Um, from a new level of aggressive and invasive questioning of our community by federal law enforcement entities to the recent witch hunt hearings held by Congressman Peter King, American Muslims and those who are perceived to be Muslim are facing greater challenges than we have ever faced in the tragic events of 9-11. While our community has been facing blatant discrimination and have been affected by bad and misguided gover government policies since 9-11, the 2010 controversy around Park 51, the proposed mosque and community center by Ground Zero, ignited a new era of increased xenophobia and Islamophobia, unlike anything we have seen before. The most striking has been in the form of blocking the building of mosques. Most recently, millions of Americans watched the story of the Murfreesboro Mosque on CNN. I'm from New York, known to many as one of the most liberal and diverse states in the country. And the Murfreesboro story is running rampant throughout the US, even in my home state. Opposition to mosque in Staten Island, New York, the Midland Beach Mosque, in Sheepset Bay, Brooklyn, where people were, are, are protesting every Friday with signs that say, no mass, no Hamas, um, and in a neighboring state in Bridgewater, New Jersey, only a few weeks ago. 
What makes now different? It's not just a few loudmouth bigots taking over the airways. It's elected officials, our representatives, people who are our decision makers, riding the wave of Islamophobia, winning elections and fundraising on the backs of Muslim Americans. City Councilwoman Deborah Poli at a rally in front of a fundraiser organized by Muslims in Yorba Linda to raise money for a shelter said, my son is in the armed forces and I know many of the armed forces that would want to give these people a faster ticket to paradise. These are our elected officials. I mentioned Peter King and his witch hunt hearings where our entire community was put on char in a trial and he's not finished. And his mastermind behind a hearing in the New York State Senate this Friday assessing protection of citizens against terrorism and recommending speakers who lack content. In this case, Noni Darwish. Similarly for Zahdi Jassid, they are what we call scholars for dollars. They make money off of hating on our community. That's what they do. And are given platforms by people like Peter King. They do not represent our community perspective, and these hearings will divide our country and not make us safer. The day before the Peter King hearings, Ahmad al-Shaybani, a prominent Arab American filmmaker in Chicago, was almost beaten to death um, due to hate crime. Uh, just most recently last week in the Daily News, a 12-year-old girl in hijab in Staten Island was assaulted. And most recently, two Sikhs elders, they weren't bothering anybody, were killed in a hate crime in California. I want to say about a youth that we work with, many of us in some of our organizations, our children only know a post-9-11 world. They do not know a world where Muslim Americans were not discriminated against. They don't know a world where Islam was a religion that was understood, and they don't know a, a, a world where they can feel safe. But I will say that in these trying times, I will say that good has come of it. Muslims, South Asians, Arabs, and others have come together. We have risen to the challenge to work for a better tomorrow for our children. And our resilience and our unity is what is going to help us overcome um, these challenges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming here, for sharing your stories. And I know that for um, many of you, it is a painful um, experience to, to have to recount these stories. So I want all of us to, again, um, thank our speakers with a round of applause. So at this point, um, we're actually going to pause to see if we can take a couple of questions from our audience. I know that there are both congressional staffers here as well as community members and allies. And so um, we're going to take a couple of questions and I'll bundle them up and kind of point them to, to the right speakers here um, before we move on to our next panel. So just raise your hand and Brahma will come to you. If you don't mind just saying your name and where you're from. I'm, I'm Nadia, I'm from, I'm living in Oakland, California. And I just wanted to thank you all. I know telling stories is actually a very, it's like reliving the process. So there's a lot of, I appreciate the strength you've shown, all of you. Uh, and uh, the question I have is in terms of, I did watch the video in Orange County with the Congre with the Councilwoman speaking and represent Rep Congressman King, who's a congressman. And what I want to know is how are these, is there any way to make sure that these people are held accountable? Where, I mean, for example, if a, a congressman has an affair, gets kicked out of office, <laughs> but if a, con a congressman re if, or an official preaches hate that leads to deaths in the most extreme cases, they're really not held accountable. And what I want to know is, what can we do? What can not even just South Asians, but activists and people who think that this is wrong, people of conscience. What can we do to be to hold our council people accountable? Be like, wow, do you know what they just said? This is racist. This is dangerous. And they and and this they sh they should lose an election because of actions like this. Not saying we would obviously it's a democratic process, but why is it that you can have an affair and lose an election, but you can preach hate and not and get reelected? May I take a couple more and then I'll bunch them up? But think about that. Who wants to answer it? Any other questions? Okay, well let's see if we can tackle the question of accountability from our elected officials. Um, if you want to take a shot at it, please just raise your hand at me. Linda, we'll start with you. 
Um, well, first of all, uh, the, the hate speaking, uh, first of all, they're protected. It means their First Amendment rights, freedom of speech, number one. Um, the reason why some elected officials lose their seats in scandals, um, usually it's, it's not just a scandal, it's because, for example, like Elliot Spitzer in New York, he used taxpayer dollars to pay for prostitutes, basically, so that's obviously against the law. But um, I think um, that's a very important, uh, important question because I think that one of the things that we're not good at in our community, and if this is a time to constructively criticize both the Muslim, South Asian, Arab communities, um, this is the time to do it. We are not as civically engaged as we need to do. You know what? what, what the way you hold people accountable is by going to the polls. You vote against them or you vote for those who protect our civil rights in our community. So the, the accountability in this country is based on being a part of the democratic process. We can rally in front of an office and tell them, we, you know, we're Muslims, we're Americans too, but you know what, if we're not going to the polls on election day, then they're gonna keep on doing that. So I think our community needs to come together, we need to be strategic, and we need to support those who support us. We need to fundraise for the politicians that support us, and we need to go to the polls. We're registered voters and we don't vote. We vote in minimal numbers. So I think accountability is based on the act of the democratic process. So I completely agree with Linda, and I just want to add to that, and that includes there are many ways to be politically active, and we need to be. Ten years after 9-11, we need not just ten organizations, we need hundreds of organizations around the country that are civically engaging us on every political issue, on local struggles around all the budget cuts that are happening. These are our issues. We have to show our face. We have to become recognizable. The, the second piece of it is that we can't do it alone. We cannot do it either only as South Asians or Muslims or Arabs. We have to join other communities who have historically won the civil rights that we even have here today that are being rolled back. We have to join the African American community, the Latino community that has been under the, sim the same rise of Islamophobia, has been the same anti-Latino, anti-immigrant sentiment, and it's the same players. It's the Tea Party, it's Peter King, it's the same policies. So we have to really build alliances, <clears throat> and we have to take ourselves out of the box of it's just us, because it's not just us. It's historically not been just us. Um, and even for those of us who can't vote, we have to just stand up for accountability. Just uh, last week, we held a press conference, which Linda was a part of, with about <clears throat> um, at least 20 Muslim organizations joined by Latino leaders, African American leaders, holding the NYPD accountable to an extremely racist training video it was using called the Third and High. So it's these moments where we have to stand rather than stay silent and take the risk. Manchu? I agree with um, both Monami and with Linda. And want to just add that, you know, we really need to reframe some of this debate and dialogue. Um, as our speaker said today, it's been placed in the frame of national security and tied in with immigration. We need this to be about human rights and the rights of our communities. And and part both of the civil rights struggle but also of the human rights struggle and I think to work across borders as well as across communities because this is uh, part and parcel of issues around globalization and um, so really to broaden the frame and when we're speaking with the media when we're at events like uh, such as the one today that's been wonderfully put together by SALT to constantly remind those in our community as well as those on the outside of um, this being part of really our regaining our human rights. Um, in, in, in 2010, about three weeks before Election Day, we did a candidates night um, in, in Southwest Brooklyn. And I got upset at my own community because my community kept on standing up and their questions to every elected or potential elected official was, what do you think about the Park 51 mosque? And I, you know, and I said, excuse me, I said, we are not a Park 51 community. We are not a community that just, that's just about Palestine or about Pakistan or about Afghanistan. We are a community that lives in the United States and we need to stand up for other issues. We have domestic issues like, you know, education reform, immigration. We have other issues, healthcare reform. So we need to also ensure that we're part of these larger discourse on domestic policy, that we're not just a foreign community that cares about foreign issues. We're not also just a community that cares about our civil liberties. This is the, about civil liberties of everyone in this country. So when we protect our civil liberties, we are protecting the civil liberties of every other American. So we need to get out of the box, box of being this like multifaceted identity, but I'm Muslim and I'm Arab and I'm Palestinian. I mean, which my community falls into all the time. Like we go into elected officials' offices and want to talk about Palestine. 
Palestine is going to be around, and that problem is going to be around for a long time. But you know what? I care about my kids getting a good education. I care about having health insurance. I don't have health insurance. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's the kind of stories that we need to be involved in, the kind of coalitions we need to work on. Because we are Americans, and we care about American issues. Thank you. Thank you time for um, another question, if anyone has one. Um, for OR, they told that we're running to Sunil. Hi, this is for, um, is it Talib? Um, yes. Talib. Hi. Um, did you issue the invitation to Peter King uh, for the one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, face off yet? And what has been the response of so? Well, as uh, uh, this for tomorrow, as we, invite, we requested a meeting with him prior to the hearings. And after two and a half weeks of not responding, making excuses, the office finally agreed to give us a meeting in DC. So on, on the February 28th at 3.15 p.m. So three of us traveled from New York to D.C. Although we all lived in New York, Peter King and myself. <laughs> he called us all the way over here. And as we approached his office door, he walked out. Oh. As we approached his office door at 5 after 3, he walked out. He stepped out. We crossed. And I knew he's a, this is it. He's a coward. He cannot face us in the eyes. That's right. And we told his aide that we are willing to wait for him to come back. He had to attend a, a so-called high-class, you know, security meeting on the Middle East process. Fine. And she said, "There is no way that you can see him today." So he refused to meet us, and the invitation I just issued it to him right here today. <laughs> But he will not respond. He will not respond because he is cashing in. He's just pandering to the base. And do not forget, he has a past supporter for two decades of IRA. You know, and so a man with his baggage being responsible for the homeland security is mind-boggling. It's, it's, it's ironic that here, on, in America, in the Congress, he is allowed to hold this position. We should challenge it. Great, and I, and I wanted to just quickly say that um, in terms of with the King hearings especially, I think that we did see a lot of the work that many of you have talked about. You know, the alliance building, the mobilization, the media work, um, the lobbying, and um, in, in many ways I do think that we were successful in pushing back what he was trying to do. Um, and, and as folks know, there was a, a hearing held by Senator Durbin last week, um, uh, thank you to Senator Durbin, on uh, looking at the civil rights of, of Muslim communities. So I think we've got some momentum. Um, that yes, we did, and I really want to take this opportunity to thank Congressman Keith Ellison. He testified on behalf of my son. Yeah.